feel like uh, going home is part of my home now. I actually, uh, with a little help of my wife, I were able to find uh, the Conley Center very well. And I want to thank uh, Father John Parrish for really organizing these wonderful exhibitions, icon exhibitions. And uh, it's really an outreach to, to orthodoxy. When I spoke at Maryland University, I was getting emails, and I'm still getting emails from that. So we're really uh, reaching out and extending the message of, of the church. And I want to thank uh, Father Richard for his love for the Eastern Orthodox Church and, and for allowing us to, to do this and for allowing uh, Father John to do what he does uh, best. Uh, Father John and I grew up together in Yonkers, and so we knew each other uh, as, as in our youth, and we continue to uh, to know each other. Um, we're in the same diocese under His Eminence Archbishop Markin, and it, when he asked me to, to speak on uh, the Sitka icon of the Mother of God, I love the Mother of God, and I, and I love talking about her. And so I, I want to begin uh, my, my presentation. I want to thank you for coming especially those who are celebrating their Western Palm Sunday today. Uh, to come out on, on Palm Sunday is, is, is tremendous, but, and hopefully you can be edified by something that I might uh, be able to, uh, to say. I know I was uh, in, in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, Stratton, Wilkes-Barre area, I was checking out the, the weather, Channel 6, to see if it was going to snow. And then I met Paul Hunchak and said, Father John, this is typical. You talk about Alaska, it has to snow. It has to, even the threat of it, it will add ambiance to your, to your presentation. But uh, we're very grateful that, that St. Herman of Alaska and Sitka uh, Madonna waved it down at east and, and further south so we can, we can enjoy uh, this afternoon. So I'll begin by my presentation by invoking the Trinity, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. The Alaska Purchase uh, is instrumental in for us to be talking about the Orthodox Church in Alaska. The Alaska Purchase was the United States acquisition of Alaska from the Russian Empire in 1867 by a treaty ratified by the United States Senate. Now, the reason I mention that is because we, you know, we sort of take that for granted and we think Alaska was always part of uh, the United States. It wasn't. It was in 1867. Russia wanted, and Bureau of Russia wanted to sell its Alaskan territory, fearing that it might be seized if war broke out with Britain. Russia's main primary activities in the territory had been the fur trade, and I'll touch upon that a little bit, and the missionary work among the native Alaskans. So they had two things at stake, the fur business, the fur trade, and the missionary outwork to the native Alaskans. The focus of the lecture series will deal with the missionary work among the native Alaskans. We won't talk about the fur traders. The other speakers might mention a little bit. I'll touch upon that, but I want to talk about the missionary work among the native Alaskans, which we have given the title, or Father John and Father Richard has given the title, The Alaskan Native Spiritual Legacy. Let's talk about the transfer of Alaska to the United States. The ceremony took place in Sitka, where the original icon, Our Lady of Sitka, resides, on October 18, 1867. Russian and American soldiers paraded in front of the governor's house. The Russian flag was lowered, and the American flag was raised. Amid peals of artillery and a lot of, a lot of salutes, the land added over a half a million square miles to the United States. It's unimaginable. 586,412 square miles to the United States. 
States, and it became a new territory to the United States. An Aleut name, Alaska, I don't know if you realize that, but it's an Aleut name, was chosen by the Americans to keep that connection with the Aleut and the Alaskan heritage. The name had earlier in the Russian era denoted the Alaska Peninsula, which the Russians called Aliaska. And so hence the name is an Aleut name, Alaska. Now, historically speaking, from the spiritual dynamic, the original Vala'a mission to Kodiak began with one Archimandrite, three priest monks, one deacon monk, one lay monk, who is St. Herman of Alaska today, together with several, several staff members. They left St. Petersburg on December 21st, 1793. They didn't fly, they didn't take Amtrak, you know. It was a difficult travel. Now imagine leaving December 21st, 1793. They, they arrived in Kodiak on September 24th, 1794. Now, these were missionaries. They traveled 7,300 miles in 293 days. What was, what was really amazing about this missionary journey, they never left Imperial Russia. Traveling 7,300 miles in 293 days, never leaving Imperial Russia. These missionary monks included St. Herman of Alaska, and you saw it at the exhibit, Father John Lake, beautiful, uh, my beautiful uh, sort of presentation with the beautiful icons and, and, and the history of, of Alaska in, in beautiful exhibit form. So St. Herman of Alaska, he was known to defending the indigenous Alaskans from the greedy practices of the government fur trading monopoly that was taking place. They fought for full citizenship rights and dignity for the native peoples. St. Herman, many don't realize, had to flee to Kodiak for Spruce Island because of threats against his life by the fur trading management because he defended the Aleuts with his life. To this day, the local residents of Kodiak refer to St. Herman as their beloved Papa, Aleut, named for grandfather. St. Herman of Alaska comforted them with the early sustenance and with words of eternal life, as we read in the Cantus to St. Herman of Alaska. St. Herman of Alaska was best known, and Father John captured it in, in the beautiful display. He says, from this day, from this hour, from this minute, let us love God above all. Once there was a flood on Spruce Island. The inhabitants ran with fear to Elder Herman, whereupon he took an icon of the Mother of God from the house where the students lived, carried it out, and placed it on shallow ground. He began to pray. And after the prayer, he turned to those who were there and said, do not fear the water will not go further than the spot where the icon is standing. With faith, with deep conviction, he gave them peace. But it was his connection with the Mother of God. In that prayer, that symmetry that took place between St. Herman and the Mother of God and the icon, the no flood took place and the orphans were spared. True to his prophecy, the water did not go past the spot, the actual spot where the icon was placed. He promised them that the icon of the Holy Queen would protect them in the future in times of similar need. 
So I just wanted to illustrate one example from the life of St. Herman of Alaska. I could draw upon others, but you're going to have other speakers, Father Michael Alexa and Father Nicholas Harris, who will probably no doubt talk about St. Herman even more. But I just wanted to show that deep love, the deep devotion that St. Herman had for the Theotokos, for the Queen of Heaven, the Alaskan mission from the very beginning was de dependent on the holy intercession of the Theotokos, the ever Virgin Mary. The faith of St. Herman and the early missionaries laid a firm foundation of faith and the icon of the holy and heavenly queen would protect them. And she continues to this very day to protect them, to intercede for them. In 1820, Father John Vinaminov arrived in Alaska together with his wife, Matushka Kathy, and his children and conducted missionary work. Among his many accomplishments was the translation of scripture and the liturgical services in native dialects for which he also devised the grammar and alphabet. I was very moved to see one of the icons of Unalaska where the young missionary and his Matushka and family went and when they arrived in Unalaska, and a lot of the priests, you know, consider, gee, I have a, a difficult parish, I don't know what to do, people don't love me, you know, I'm having difficulties. When he arrived in Unalaska and he stepped foot out of Alaska, he was met by the local, local Indians and they told him to leave. We don't want you here. Please leave us. I'll skip 10 years. He was there for 10 years. When Father John Vinaminov, the Mashka Kathy, left after 10 years in their family, they built a church. He built a rectory himself, made the furniture, translated, began translating the, the Gospel of Matthew into the local language, just listening, living among them. And this time, when he was leaving, they all knelt before him, weeping and crying, and telling Father John Vinaminov not to leave, not to leave. Please stay among us. Father John Vinaminov is responsible for that intellectual mind that he had, the grasp of translations, of building. He had a carpenter's gene, the ability to, to build and to construct his own furniture, to build the church, to be, to be so pious as, as not to interfere with their local customs and traditions, but he absorbed them as his very own and created this Cyrillic alphabet that they can call their own. His approach to language and inculturation of the gospel was fully rooted, by the way, in Orthodox tradition. Rather than demand of a use of a specific language for enforced indoctrination, Eastern Orthodox Christians have more often tried to sanctify a culture and its language and its customs to bring out which already something that contains the word, the spiritus logos, and to encourage the native expression of the good news of Jesus Christ. When Father John was guiding us through his exhibit, it was so beautiful to hear the creed being sung in the native Aleut language and in their own hymns. St. Innocent was an heir to this glorious tradition and proved faithful to his calling. He was a true, true apostle, bringing the good news of salvation to the indigenous people who already, who already by their
pious life were ready to receive the word of God. Much like St. Cyril and Methodius, the work of Father John Vinaminov planted the seeds of an authentically local Orthodox Church in Alaska. Its faithful, its priests, its stewards, is an organic, integral part of the fabric of the First Nations, the Native peoples, and all the peoples of Alaska. Tragedy struck this great missionary, Father John, the death of his dear wife, Catherine. Father John Vinaminov was elected bishop and returned to Alaska as a bishop now, as Bishop Inokenti. He learned how to speak the Tlingit language, and the Tlingits loved him as he went out to understand the way of life and their spiritual needs. He provided them with medicines and vaccines. Today, 90% of the cathedral congregation at St. Michael's in Sitka is Lincoln, as well as other native groups. The music in the liturgy is sung a cappella in English, Slavonic, Lincoln, Aleut, and Yupik. The incorporation of all of the Native American culture and, and tradition and languages. St. Michael's Cathedral in Sitka, and you've seen, you can see pictures of it in the display, is a great example of Russian Orthodox Church architecture. The greatest Orthodox missionary in Alaska, the former Father John Vinaminov, becoming Bishop in Okenki, becoming later, as I'll mention, Metropolitan of Moscow, and then canonized by the churches as St. Innocent, designed it. He became a bishop in 1840. He was the first bishop of Alaska. And upon his return to Sitka in 1841, he began the planning of the construction of the cathedral. It was Bishop Inokenki who laid the cornerstone in 1844. On November 20th, 1848, Bishop Inokenki consecrated St. Michael the Archangel Russian Orthodox Cathedral in Sitka. The building is laid out in the form of a cross with three altars, the original one, dedicated from left to right, and the presence of the Sitka Mother of God icon was before us. It's encased in the cathedral. It's taken out on tours throughout the continental United States. And perhaps you venerated the original icon, our, our Sitka Madonna. And I want to thank Father John for providing a beautiful copy of this icon. The wonder-working Sitka icon of the Mother of God, the Queen of Heaven, is a beautiful and magnificent copy here before us. It was commissioned in the early 1800s by then still Father John Vinominov. He had this in mind. The future Metropolitan of Moscow and glorified saint realized that if the mission in Alaska, in North America, would take off. It would only take off by the holy intercession of the Mother of God. Without her, no missionary activity would be possible in its fullest sense. The icon of Our Lady of Sitka is painted in the same style as the Kazan Mother of God icon, almost the same style. It resides, as I mentioned, in the Cathedral of Archangel Michael in Sitka, Alaska, and it was a gift from the laborers of the Russian-American company. So, Father John Vinaminov, not only did he have this icon commissioned, but he had it donated. He was a good, good priest. He was able to manage the finances very well. Someone donated the icon, the Russian-American company. 
It was painted by a very famous iconographer, Vladimir Borovikovsky, a protege of the Empress Catherine II. It is 36 by 171 inches in size, with a detailed Elisa of silver covering it. This is the Elisa that's covering it. You can, you can see it in the original one. It's all silver. Except for the faces and the hands of the Mother of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, everything else is covered. Oftentimes, a Elisa of silver or gold, and sometimes you see precious gems like the original uh, Kazan icon, is placed on the icon by the faithful. Why? In thanksgiving for the answered prayers. People would go up to the icon and pray before her for a holy intercession, and when a prayer was answered, they would leave their jewelry in front of the icon, and the good priest would make that part of, part of the icon. Many miracles have been attributed to the Sitka icon. Now, it is believed that the gaze of the eyes of the Theotokos have led many to restore health for those who pray before the icon. You can see that this icon, when you look at the eyes, the eyes are very tender, very gentle, very embracing, not piercing, but embracing. They really become for us the, the eyes and the icon, the windows to heaven itself, to the heavenly throne. Now, it could be done with this icon, you can do it later. When you gaze upon this holy icon, you will notice that no matter where you stand, you could be standing in this corner, you could be standing in this corner, her eyes seem to look in your direction. It makes eye contact with you personally. In this icon, Jesus is seen as a small adult almost. He's not seen as an infant, but a small adult, blessing, sanctifying, standing in his mother's arms, facing the faithful, as I mentioned, blessing already, directly us. His mother's gaze is thoughtful and tender is a beautiful adjective, very tender, and her head is inclined toward her beloved son, as though she is contemplating his mission as our Savior, who has come into the world to suffer the passion. The Kontakian hymn that they have for the Sitka icon, I'd like to just share that with you because it somehow puts together a theology and a meaning why this icon is there. It goes, O Mother of God, chosen from all generations to be the protectress of the Christian people, we offer you songs of thanksgiving for your wonder-working icon that has come to Alaska. With this icon, comes our Lord Jesus Christ. The Mother of God presents Christ to us. And I'll develop this and the importance of this as I go on. There's an Akathis hymn that is sung to this icon by the native Clinkets and Aleuts and, and all who belong to the cathedral. And some, some of the words to the hymn. I selected just only four parts of the Akathis to show you the real connection that the natives have with the Mother of God, crying out to her in times of need. She truly becomes an intercessor for them. We recognize you as the Mother of our Lord Jesus Christ the only true God. Your all-pure face looks down from your holy icon on the glorious town of Sitka. And worshiping your Son with love and joy, we sing to God. 
that the icon of the mother of God somehow looks down upon the city of Sitka and embraces the entire city. And she is the Theotokos. And she presents Jesus Christ, the only true God, to the people of Sitka. And here you can see their struggle among the Aleuts and what they have to deal with. This is from the Akathos also. A storm of passions and sins rages against us, and we don't know where to turn. It is then that the Holy Mother of God gives us and shows us her peace. And gazing at the icon she has sent us, we cry to thanksgiving to God. Hallelujah. You know, so often, it's not just the Aleuts who are suffering from a storm of passions and sins that raise rages. I like the strong word rages against us. And what can we do to balance this off? It's the mother of God and her gaze and her peacefulness. If you continue to look upon this beautiful icon, if you're raging and if you're upset, the more you look, that icon truly has a calming effect and gives us a sense of peace and tranquility. And the final one that I selected from the Akathis, it says, We are beset by hardships in this far northern land. We are lifted up by the faith of Father Herman, who instilled in us by the prayers of Our Lady of Sitka. So we take upon ourselves with hope and fortitude the cross our Lord has given each one of us, and to sing to her, Rejoice, Mother of the Most High God. Rejoice, protectress of those who run to you. Rejoice, giver of what is needful for all who pray before your holy, wonder-working icon. They're not denying the fact that living in northern, this northern land, there is hardship, there is difficulties. But remember, I, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk about St. Herman of Alaska when he was protecting the orphans on Spruce Island, and he took the queen icon, the queen of heaven, and placed it on the ground and said, the flood will not go past this icon. So the Aleuts have passed on this tradition, instilled in them from one generation to the other generation. St. Herman of Alaska taught us to love the Mother of God, the Queen of Heaven, that she is all that we need. She will protect us if we run to her. Quite a difference from what the secular world is telling us today, right? If you're beset by hardships, difficulties, passions, and sins, go to a psychiatrist. Or go to some therapist, lay on the couch and talk about uh, the problems and the difficulties that you had and how you were mistreated in life. It's a completely different approach to healing, isn't it? Calling upon the Mother of God and asking her to give us this peace this tranquility, this love, instilling in us the love for Jesus Christ. The Mother of God calls us to that relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this wonder-working icon, I don't want to minimize or underestimate the love that, that the native Aleuts and Clinkets and all of the tribes in Alaska have for the Blessed Mother, instilled to them from the native, native St. Herman of Alaska who taught them the love of the Blessed Mother. Father John spent, I believe, a few years in Alaska and he knows firsthand the simplicity, the difficulty, but yet at the same time their devotion to the Mother of God. It's part of their fabric, it's part of their identity, it's who they are. As many times as they fall, it's just that many times that they get up and they repent and they go to the Mother of God and ask for the holy intercession. The Russian
Russian monks, the missionaries, when they arrived, presented Orthodox Christianity not as the abolition, but as the fulfillment of the Aleut's ancient religious heritage. The fulfillment of it. Most pervasively, the personal example of Monk Hermit provided the native with tangible evidence that the gospel, when embraced with full dedication and commitment, produced God-like men. You know, their Native American religion spoke of a shaman, one who was holy, who, who was a miracle worker. And they realized that the gospel, when fully embraced, they had an example of St. Herman of Alaska who would intercede for them. He became for them the Apa, the real shaman, the fulfillment of all shamans. Father Michael Alexa, the speaker for the lecture series next Sunday, and I hope everybody comes back, goes into great detail about this relationship in his very famous book, Orthodox Alaska. How many elements of the pre-Christian Alaskan worldview were not abolished? rather fulfilled in Orthodox Christianity. A number of those themes is, is cyclic time and symbol as an expression of true reality shows direct parallels. An example cited that the role of the pre-Christian shaman, which could not only be assumed by one who under has undergone a ritual death and rebirth, someone who had to go to the land of the spirits and return. Alaskan people could very clearly grasp the truth of Christ's necessary death, descend into Hades and resurrection for the salvation and transformation of their souls and bodies. They had that pre-Christian culture and that view already. The pre-Christian worldview was maximalistic in view of ritual action participating in the eternally significant events of those days when the condition of man was less fragmented, less broken, but more authentic, more real. I remember reading a story of uh, a very famous Aleut who, who, made, who made carpets in the, in the art. Father John has shown some parts of the Aleuts and there was a beautiful carpet that he had and illustrated the sunrise. And someone came to him and said, I want to duplicate that sunrise. Teach me how to do it. And the uh, Aleut artist said, First, I want you to get up every morning and experience the sunrise for yourself. After you do that, do that for a year. Get up every morning and see the sunrise. Then come back and we'll talk. That's sort of an interesting view, isn't it? Experience it. The ritual of action participating in it. The condition of man was less fragmented, less broken, but more real. Ritual actions upon leaving and entering one's home and the layout of traditional native dwellings strive to represent the cosmos in microcosm. We try to do that at our own home with the icon corner, with greeting each other, with embracing each other. I remember visiting my grandparents' home, and before you said anything, you didn't say, hi, Baba, hi, Dido, you said, Slava Jesus this, glory be to Jesus Christ. Then you venerated the icon. Then you said, how are you doing? You know? That world view is, we're losing that, that touch that, that has been handed down, and so I pray that that, that you can recapture the things that we think are overly simplistic, really present a holistic view of man and where we are 
in relationship to God today. Similar in orthodoxy, making the sign of the cross, are liturgical blessings of water and wine and oil. I remember going for Holy Supper before Christmas in Baba's house, and they would make the sign of the cross as they would put the water uh, to make sure the sign of the cross. So it's not the ritualistic liturgical blessing of the priest, but also we do things at home. And, and, and the home becomes for us the little church. Church architecture, iconography, everything we do is a means of harmonizing and directing our hearts towards God in Jesus Christ, the traditions that have been handed down to us. When we look upon the Sitka icon of the Mother of God, she becomes for us and synthesizes for us a means of harmonizing and directing our heart towards God in Christ our Lord. The name Theotokos has a direct foundation in sacred scripture. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 4, verse 4, and this epistle is sung by the cantor or read in church on Christmas Day. Listen to this. And is a direct reference to the Theotokos, the Mother of God. When the fullness of the time was come, St. Paul says this, not the Lucian Gospel, which we're familiar with, but St. Paul says, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. Galatians 4.4. 4. Here is expressed the truth that a woman gave birth to the Son of God. The Son of God becomes the Son of Man. And in 1 Timothy 3.16, St. Paul says to Timothy, God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. You know, when I go to uh, sometimes the ecumenical circles, and then a prayer has to be said. There's a discussion among some of the, quote, clergy who say, we all believe in a higher power, so let's pray to the higher power. In the Orthodox and Catholic tradition, we believe, as St. Paul says, God was manifest in the flesh, the higher power became one of us. He became our brother in the flesh. We're creating his image and likeness. He took on, he was incarnate for us. This is why the Theotokos is always with her son, Jesus Christ. A very rare icon, maybe the icon of the protection of the mother of God, which is a historical phenomenon took place in church, but all written icons, she presents Christ to us. So it's not just a higher power somewhere. God is incarnate for us. St. Paul says, the flesh was woven for God in the Logos, the Word, by the most holy Virgin Mary. The Orthodox Church honors and also the Western Church honors and venerates the Virgin Mary. Listen to the high elevation that we give her. More honorable than the cherubim, more glorious without compare than, her ser than the seraphim. Her name is mentioned in every service, every Orthodox service, her name is mentioned. Her intercession before the throne of God is asked. She is given the, the title Theotokos, Greek for the birth giver of God, as well as the mother of God. This woman, the Theotokos Virgin Mary Bohorodice, has a definite role in Orthodox and Western. 
Western Christianity and can in no wise be considered an instrument which once used was laid aside and forgotten. There are traditions that forget about her completely and, 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 and miss the whole point of our relationship with Jesus Christ. The angel Gabriel, let's get to the root of the Sitka Aita, right? Where it began, the mother of God, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to announce to the Virgin the birth of the Savior. And there's an angelic salutation in Luke 138. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Prefigured 
as a typology here in Ezekiel 44, verse 2. Mary dedicated her life for that sole purpose. I remember how important dedication was and the symbol of that. Remember the class of Father Vladimir Borachevsky. And he took the sacred chalice and he brought it into class one day. And he said, this chalice has been dedicated to be the means by which we receive the body and blood of Christ. It was dedicated and was consecrated. How many of you would dare take the chalice that's been dedicated, consecrated, and take it home and use it as a wine god? Can't do that. Because its purpose was not for your home for a wine goblet, but it's been dedicated to be that chalice. And so the mother of God, from time and eternity, she was offered to be from her flesh, from her, from her womb, Emmanuel, came into the world. And the same is true of the burning bush seen by Moses. Mary contained in her womb the God-man, Jesus Christ, the God who was a consuming fire and was not consumed. With perfect obedience and humility, Mary gives her reply to an angel and with it overturns the curse of the first parents. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Luke 138 is probably the most important text of Scripture because she says yes to the Incarnation. She says yes to the Archangel Gabriel. She says yes to the Salutation. Thus with the Archangel Gabriel, we can all cry out to her from the depths of our hearts. Our love for her. <coughs> now, by her saying yes, there's a theological word called, called synergy. The cooperation of our will with the will of God. Mary said yes. Let it be to me according to your word. And here I selected some from the Akathis to the mother of God. Four verses. Rejoice, Mary, through whom joy will shine forth. Rejoice, Mary, you are the star who makes the sun appear. Rejoice, womb, her womb, of divine incarnation. Rejoice, Mary, through whom the Creator becomes for us a newborn child. Now, we are celebrating the feast, and I believe the Western Church also, the Feast of the Annunciation on Friday. Listen to the words, how important the role of Mary is. You know, in the Orthodox Church, in our liturgical discipline, there are no divine liturgies permitted Monday through Friday except the pre-sanctified liturgies, which the priest consecrated another lamb if they're going to have pre-sanctified on Wednesday. Except, except the Feast of the Annunciation. Divine liturgy is permitted. We are wearing blue. The altar covers are changed to blue because it is the feast that is above that. And this is the true part. Today is the beginning of our salvation. Luke 1, 56, her saying yes, is a direct parallel to this part. Today is the beginning of our salvation, the revelation of the eternal mystery. The Son of God becomes the Son of for the Virgin as Gabriel announces the coming of grace. Together with him, with Gabriel, let us cry to the Theotokos, rejoice full of grace. The Lord is with you. The rejection of this truth revealed in 
the beautiful title of Mary is Theotokos. The rejection of her and her role in salvific history. The rejection of Mary in missionary outposts throughout the world creates and undermines the real mission of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Rejection of the truth revealed in this beautiful title, as revealed in this beautiful icon, has led to a diminution in the understanding of the role of Mary, impeding some Christians from grasping a deeper truth concerning the meaning of Mary's life, her fiat, her yes to God's will. If you don't have Mary in your life, if you don't understand the Theotokos, if you don't understand Luke 1, 56, if you don't understand the humility of God and, the, and, and God's coming to us, the self-emptying, the kenosis, and so on, the eustorchenia of God, then you don't fully understand Christ. Then it's very easy to say, brothers, let us all say a prayer to the higher power. It's a rejection of the Incarnation, it's the rejection of the Church, it's the rejection of the Apostles. To venerate this icon, Our Lady of Sitka, is to accept in the fullest tradition the expression of the Gospel, of what St. Paul says. The Seventh Ecumenical Council dealt predominantly with the controversy regarding icons and their place in Orthodox worship. When Father John so graciously asked me to come back with the blessing of Father Richard to Villanova and to speak on this day on the icon of Our Lady of Sitka, I looked at the calendar and said, Father John, it's the Sunday of Orthodoxy. I don't think we fully realized it at the time, but God ordained it, God planned it this way. Today, in 787, not rather today, but the Seventh Ecumenical Council in 1787 was, was convened by Empress Irene. And this council was attended by 367 bishops. The church was persecuted up to the Edict of Milan. And I can just picture those bishops, scarred, limping, coming to this Ecumenical Council to formulate this position on the role of the Theotokos in the Church. The day was called the Triumph of Orthodoxy. Since that time, this event is commemorated yearly with a special service on the first Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the Triumph of Orthodoxy. What is this Triumph of Orthodoxy? It's reduced to this lady, the Theotokos, through a spacious womb, through her saying yes to God, Luke 1, 56, allowing the symmetry, the cooperation of God's will with man's will coming to us, and Emmanuel, the promised Messiah, coming to us. The teaching of icons is defined by the Seventh Ecumenical Medical Council of 787, is embodied in the text sung on this Sunday from Vespers. I miss Vespers. But I'm here with you talking about icons. And so I want to quote from a part of Vespers that all over the continental United States and the 3,000 Orthodox churches that we have, somewhere this is being sung in some church. The grace of truth has begun to sh shine out. The things once foreshadowed are now revealed in perfection. Referring to the Old Testament, right? Are now revealed in perfection. See, the church is decked with an embodied image of Christ. Embodied image of Christ, blessing us. As with beauty not of this world, fulfilling the tent of witnesses, St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews today in liturgy, if you were in liturgy in the Orthodox Church, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, fulfilling the tent of witnesses, holding fast the Orthodox faith. And here are the words from Vespers. For if we cling to the icon of him we worship, we shall not go astray. The alley 
slaves to Clintus, to Eskimos. They might be simple people, but they're loving people. If they cling to the icon, they have more spirituality than some PhD somewhere who can't figure out who he is in relationship to God who plays, prays to a higher power. The faith is given to the simple because the simple accept it not in their mind but in their heart. Not in their mind but in their heart. It has to go from the mind to the heart. Father Borachevsky, our dean at the seminary, the Father John knows so well as I do. He says the shortest, the longest distance in life has the shortest distance from the mind to the heart. Cling to the icon of him whom we worship and we will not go astray. The theme of the victory of icons by its emphasis on incarnation points to the basic Christian truth that the one whose death and resurrection we celebrate at Easter and the Western brothers and sisters in Christ are celebrating Easter this, this coming Sunday and Good Friday. We celebrated Easter was none other than the Word of God who became human in Jesus Christ. The Sunday of Orthodoxy commemorates the restoration of icons in the churches and their use in Orthodox worship. And we have a responsibility, both the West and the East, to present this teaching, this ecumenical teaching from the ecumenical councils to a fragmented country, to a fragmented society who is starving for the truth of orthodoxy and doesn't realize it. The focal point of the icon itself on the Sunday of orthodoxy is the virgin, the Theotokos as directress, or literally she who shows the way to God. The Sitka Madonna is a beautiful example of that icon. Her eyes are fixed at us so that we can receive that peace and joy and quietness that she has. But the focal point of the icon is Christ through the Blessed Mother, blessing us, sanctifying us. St. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, when I was doing research on this talk, Colossians 1.15, he says, Christ is the icon of the invisible God in whom all things were made. How fitting. Scriptural text for us. Christ is the icon of the invisible God in whom all things were made. Today, the troparium for Our Lady of Sitka, and I'm concluding my talk, I, I spoke of the Kondakium, but this is the troparium. Today, like the morning star rising over us, your all honor icon enlightens the world with rays of mercy. And our land receives it as a divine gift from on high. Glorifying you, the birth giver of God, our Lady of Sitka. With joy, she is magnifying Christ our Lord, who was born of you. Pray to him, O Lady. Mary, Queen, and Theotokos, that all cities and all lands be protected from our enemies, and that they will be saved who in faith venerate your most pure icon that has come to dwell with us, O Virgin Mother, who shows us the way to Christ. It is time to, to re-examine the deeper implications of the treasure that is found in the life and example and message of this wonderful title.
Mary, the mother of God, Theotokos, or Our Lady of Sitka. It reveals a profound truth, not only about Mary, but it reveals the truth about each and every one of us. Because now we are invited into the very relationship that she has with her son. We can have that same relationship. That's what this icon is telling us. And I conclude with the synaxarium that is read by all of the clergy holding the icons. And it sort of puts in proper focus this beautiful day, the Sunday of Orthodoxy. As the prophets beheld, as the apostles have taught, as the church has received, as the teachers have dogmatized, as the universe has agreed, as grace has shown forth, as truth has been revealed, as falsehood has been dissolved, as wisdom has presented, as Christ awarded, thus we declare, thus we assert, thus we preach, Christ our true God, and honor as saints in words, in writings, in thoughts, in sacrifices, in churches, and in holy icons. On the one hand, worshiping and reverencing Christ as God and Lord, and on the other hand, honoring as true servants of the Lord. All accordingly offered them veneration. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the Orthodox. This is the faith which has established the universe. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Thank you.